so um it's 10.01 so good morning everybody Welcome. Welcome to um, this special cabinet panel. Um, this is a meeting um, drawn together to assist all members to consider um, important um, items of business for the council. And the attendance this morning um, is following is virtual following the government announcement that the UK has now moved into the delay phase of the response to the coronavirus pandemic. The Council will be holding this meeting electronically in accordance with the relevant regulations. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the special cabinet panel are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphone off once they have finished speaking. To indicate a wish to speak, Members should request to speak using the chat function if they are able. If not, put up their hand and I'll, I'll try and note that you're there. <laughs> um, and I will ask members to vote for, against or abstain for each item at the end of each debate. Um, and I was going to use the chat function for that. But um, if members aren't able to see chat, I will have to ask as I will check as well how you wish to vote. OK. I will declare the result after each vote. Officers in are in attendance, but will keep their cameras and microphones switched off unless they are asked to speak. So as um, a form of introduction, I'm County Councillor Theresa Heritage. I'm the Deputy Leader of the Council and have been asked to chair this special cabinet panel. Um, also today, um, we have representatives from all of the groups um, and I'm going to ask each group separately just to introduce themselves. So could I start with the Labour group, please? Uh, could I start with you, Josh? Good morning, everyone. I'm Councillor Bennett Lovell representing Old Stevenage on, and here on behalf of the Labour group. Thank you. Drida? Mm -hmm. Good morning, uh, Councillor Dreda Gordon from the Labour Group and I represent London Coney Division. Thank you. Um, Lib Dem Group, Stephen Giles Medhurst, please. Uh, Councillor Stephen Giles Medhurst, leader of the Liberal Democrat Group on the County Council and representing our Central Watford and Oxy. Thank you. Steve Jarvis. Steve Jarvis, uh, Liberal Democrat County Councillor for Royston West and Rural. Thank you. Um, Ron Tyndall. Are you there, Ron? Sorry, a minute ago. Yeah, never mind, we'll come back. Um, so I'll move to the Conservative group, if I may. Could I ask Richard Roberts, please? Good morning, Richard Roberts. Uh, I represent the King's Langley Division, <laughs> and I'm the Executive Member for Adult Social Care and its relationship with health. Thank you. Thank you. Fiona Hill. Good morning, I'm Fiona Hill, Deputy Executive Member for Adult Care and Health and represent Voice and East and Ermine. Thank you. Ralph Sangster. Hi, uh, my name is Ralph Sangster. I am uh, the Executive Member for Resources and Performance and I represent uh, Whitmansworth West. Thank you. Bob Deering. Uh, hello, my name is Bob Deering. Um, I'm Ralph's Deputy um, and my division is Hartford St Andrews. Thank you. Terry Hone. Yeah, Councillor Jerry Hone, representing Letchworth South. I'm the uh, Executive Member for Community Safety and Waste Management. And Colin Woodward. Woodward, um, good morning. I'm the uh, Deputy Executive Member for Community Safety and Waste Management and Councillor for Bishop Stortford West. Thanks, Colin. And for people watching, Colin's got a bit of a problem with his camera this morning. Um, <laughs> and can we go back to Ron Tyndall again, if you're there, Ron? I've now managed to unmute the mic. Uh, Ron Tyndall, Hemel Hempstead St Paul's, uh, representing Liberal Democrats. Thank you very much, Ron. Thank you. So we'll move into the meeting. Can I remind members about their declarations of interests um, as itemed on the agenda for the um, <coughs> meeting? Um, members should have disclosed these in advance, but if obviously you've come across anything as we go through the agenda, please notify myself. So um, we now move on to agenda item one, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, there are four 
items, no, sorry, three items um, which um, had actions. Um, all this technology, if you bear with me, let's go look at <laughs> the responses to those. Um, So we have, um, there was a question as so an action um, arising for um, the uh, Ian, Ian McBeath, the Director of Ch Children's Services, um, and it was about sharing information. Um, so it's about sh uh, sharing information with district and borough councils. Um, and there has been extensive work with districts and boroughs around sharing engagement with the councils. Um, and all um, vulnerable people, shielded people, are being um, contacted either by county or district officers. Um, and if anybody has any more questions around that, I can ask Helen Manerve to speak um, on that one. Um, the second action um, was around GPs and let the letter that we sent to GPs, and that has been um, circulated to members. And then finally, uh, the, there was an action for myself, and this was around the debate um, around sending a letter. But if members could refer to 3.14 of the agenda of the previous minutes, um, and there's a comment there about this letter, and that um, straight after we had had our meeting virtually, um, central government ad announced additional funding and so this letter had not been sent, but please be assured that we are reviewing that um, constantly. So may I take these minutes as a true record? Um, num, num, num. So what we'll be doing is... So bear with me. Right, so... This is where we're going to try and use chat. So please could you all indicate in the chat button um, whether you agree that these minutes. Terry, uh, Josh and I weren't the Labour representatives on the last cabinet meeting. That's fine. Thanks very much. So um, members are, are in agreement, so that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just so this is, gonna, this is there are a lot of agenda items on this uh, at this panel, so I will be um, let's say not controlling but administering um, some better control than I did last time um, on uh, the conversations. So uh, effectively, I'm allowing about 20 minutes each item, um, but obviously, if we do need more, we will allow for more. So I'm going to move into the first item on the agenda which is Hertfordshire County Council's response to COVID-19. And um, Owen Mapley, Chief Executive, would like to say a few words. Owen. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Heritage. Conscious there is a lot in this paper and a lot to cover. So a very brief intro for me and then over to councillors for questions and, and debate. Um, again, another comprehensive update on all that we're up to included in the paper. Uh, four quick things, though, that I want to particularly uh, stress has been um, uh, very significant in our attention. Um, first on uh, continued uh, things around PPE, uh, both the uh, uh, guidance around its application and supporting uh, distribution of PPE uh, to uh, users across the county. Uh, that's been very significant. The second area, uh, particularly around infection control uh, and working with uh, care providers, particularly care homes, I'd like to continue to pay tribute to the HCPA, the Providers Association, who our officers are working incredibly closely with them. Just yesterday, there was a webinar uh, where uh, public health professionals, adult care professionals, uh, infection control nurses from the NHS, um, all were talking to a large number of providers to talk about the evolving position around uh, guidance on in infection control. Third area on testing, very significant ramp up in testing since uh, the last special cabinet panel. Uh, so uh, very pleased to see support from a number of partners, including the military, on a very significant increase in testing, including at some pop-up centres in Hertfordshire. 
And also just to flag that whilst uh, action is very uh, strong, is continuing very strongly on all elements of our uh, response to the pandemic, we're also increasingly looking at uh, work around recovery, both for uh, things where we think there may be pent up demand um, during the lockdown, uh, but also uh, recovering other services that may have been delayed or stopped uh, during the uh, during the, the pandemic period. There are so many other areas I could touch on, including our work with uh, education partners, child protection, shielding, volunteers, uh, household waste recovery, uh, um, recycling centres, the financial impacts, uh, etc. But I won't take any more time. Um, I just want to finish with a renewed thank you to uh, colleagues, partners, councillors, volunteers, teachers, just across Hertfordshire. Um, just uh, I'm absolutely uh, in awe of the efforts that I see. So uh, sincere uh, gratitude to all of them. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Um, can I now ask um, Ralph Sanks to please as lead um, cabinet member on this subject? Thank you, uh, Terry um, and Chair. Uh, I just wanted to cover the um, the financial position for of the council um, since our last meeting, which um, of which uh, has already been said. Great concern was raised regarding the uh, sums of monies being received from central government to cover the COVID uh, uh, ex, uh, pressures that we were we were we were uh, 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 receiving. Um, the original uh, sum of 26 million was received. Uh, from the first 1.6 billion that was allocated to local government, and post our meeting, as been has been said, a further 1.6 billion was allocated to local government, uh, of which 21 million came directly to HCC, uh, and I believe overall Hertfordshire increased its uh, its take by about 8 million, uh, including the district and borough councils. So. Uh, Hertfordshire County Council now has some £47 million uh, to contribute to the costs that we're incurring uh, supporting the uh, uh, the community whilst this COVID uh, situation uh, developed. Um, we, uh, we, we're still not sure whether that will cover all of our costs. Uh, we're still keeping a, a sharp eye on budget uh, pressures. Uh, and should circumstances arise where we think those those costs are going to be exceeded, further lobbying will will take place. Um, uh, the government have indicated that they will be receptive to that. Um, we are making further returns uh, on a on a on a uh, a monthly basis to the central government of the costs that we're incurring, uh, and the next one will be due this Friday, I believe. Um, uh, so uh, there is a good dialogue between us and central government over the costs and the remu and the, the funds that are being provided. You will also recall that at the last meeting we approved some additional funding uh, uh, um, uh, items uh, for expenditure as a consequence uh, of our, our response to COVID um, and uh, one of them was the locality budget and at, the, at that time we were we were progress. We were projecting a 35 million pound ex, uh, excess uh, pressure, but with only a 26 billion million pound um, uh, additional funding. So all of those items had not yet been implemented uh, up until uh, today. But one of them, uh, the locality budget, which I think is some 390 million uh, for an extra 5k for each of our councillors will be implemented uh, later this week. Uh, the uh, executive member for um, local uh, uh, localism, localism will be announcing how that is to be spent. Uh, and I think uh, it will become as it will come as a, a useful tool for local councillors to uh, support local charities and, and local groups to support their communities in this uh, current situation. So we have uh, a, a, a substantial sum of money. We're not sure whether it's gonna, going to support the full costs, but we're keeping an eye on it. And I'm sure as time progresses, we'll be reporting that back to uh, council and to members. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now have uh, Ron Tyndall. Please, Ron. Ron, can you turn your mute off? OK, whilst we're waiting for okay, Ron. To... Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll I'll kick off with 6.1.4. Uh, 
I'm concerned at the level of mental health availability, mental health offer to uh, frontline staff, particularly in care homes when they're dealing with the increase in the unfortunate deaths of residents and also anybody who has to go into homes, private homes, looking after people. So I would like confirmation that we are making every effort to provide individual counselling, individual mental health offers to uh, the frontline staff, uh, both of our own staff and of contractors, while this crisis is on, please. OK, do you want to ask your other questions and I can get officers to respond? Uh, on the domestic abuse question, uh, obviously I'm very concerned at the increasing level of domestic abuse caused by the circumstances, which is very tragic and unfortunate, but unavoidable in some cases. And uh, But there are, there are pressures on refugees and we're now having victims housed in bed and breakfast. I wonder if we could have an update on where we are with that and the efforts being made to improve the refuge uh, offers so that we can avoid putting victims into bed and breakfast. Thanks, Terry. Is that any more? Do you have another one, um, Ron? No, that's fine. 6.4.1 and, uh, and section 10. OK, so um, so can I ask uh, Chris Badger or Helen or and or Helen Manerve to pick up on those questions, please? Yeah, I can. Uh, first of all, I'll pick up on the question about mental health um, support. Uh, Councillor Tin is absolutely right that it's vital that we get mental health support to uh, care colleagues working on the front line in some pretty um, traumatic um, situations. So. Again, echoing uh, Owen's point about working with the Hearts Care Providers Association, um, we've um, set up an employee assistance programme with them, which is uh, free of charge to care providers to allow um, uh, mental health support to be provided to care workers, ranging from um, web-based uh, support and materials all the way through to uh, counselling for those that have um, experienced uh, a significant trauma as part of the response to um, uh, the crisis. Um, one's absolutely right that, 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 that these, these, these colleagues are absolutely on the front line of what's going on and will be experiencing things they won't have experienced before. So it's vital that that mental health support is in there and worked quite quickly to get that established. And we're monitoring the uptake of that service to make sure it's being used effectively. And if we, if we feel it isn't, we'll do more to promote it uh, with the Hearts Care Providers Association. Thank you. And Helen, can you respond to about domestic abuse, please? Sorry. There we go. Oh, yeah. Morning, everybody. Um, Morning. So um, Helen Gladill and the Domestic Abuse Partnership, the Hertfordshire Wide Organisation, uh, are meeting regularly during the coronavirus emergency to make sure we are um, supporting domestic abuse abuse providers to help them with uh, with uh, work in this period. Uh, Helen's also sitting on the accommodation cell, which is uh, tasked with housing uh, people who are sleeping rough and making sure we're getting appropriate support into people. Um, and as part of that is also uh, making sure that the domestic abuse agenda is being uh, progressed through that route. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Richard, did you want to make a comment on this? Yeah, just just briefly, uh, Chairman, the the government is putting an, 80, an additional eighty seven million uh, into domestic abuse, recognising that at this time of lockdown, uh, and and actually recognising the point that Ron is raising, uh, that there is uh, the potential and the reality of more uh, coercive behaviours, uh, difficult to deal with in the close proximity that families find themselves. Uh, and I think one of the, uh, the potential fallouts uh, from the lockdown is uh, uh, concerns around children uh, uh, in families um, and uh, partners uh, potentially suffering abuse. Uh, and so the additional funding linked through, uh, as uh, Helen Minerva has just said, through Helen Gledhill's team uh, and in uh, both specialist accommodation and the specialist services um are, is most welcome thank you Jim. thank you okay thank you i now got a question uh terry holmes indicated he has a comment question 
Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Just to say, on um, the 6.8, the Environment and Infrastructure Waste Update, just to keep uh, the, the panel updated, we have announced that we are going to open 10 of our House of Waste Recycling Centres on Monday. That's in alignment, generally speaking, with our neighbours. So we're all opening sites as of Monday. Yes, with special things in place, the safety and concern of visitors and, and uh, operatives is a high priority. And there's been a lot of training, a lot of things put in place. Managing the highway will be a big issue, but we are going to open 10 on Monday. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen Giles Medhurst. All right. I, yeah, I'm unmuted. It was firstly back to Ralph uh, in terms of, or for that matter, Scott, I'm assuming here somewhere. Yes. Uh, in terms of the, fu the funding allocation. So according to the figures, we've uh, cap the county has received, for, will have received, if you haven't received the other 20 odd million, 47.8 million. The previous report that we had to the last special cabinet panel indicated our costs of 36 million, but there was a 12 million question mark over the money uh, to the CCG in, in terms of bed placements. So I wonder if that issue about the 12 million has yet been clarified or indeed we're going to have to cover that cost out now out of the L 47.8. And actually I should have started by echoing the, uh, the comments of Owen Mapley in terms of the workhouse staff uh, and our providers and indeed the wider community have been doing. Uh, and I echo that in terms of a non-biased political support from across all the political parties uh, in terms of thanking them for their work. So clarification on that, obviously uh, as, as a district member as well as, us, as most of us are, uh, I think it's been helpful that the districts have equally received additional funds this time because they obviously have uh, uh, different types of cost pressures, particularly over loss of income. Uh, so, but we do need to keep an eye on where this is going. And, and in terms of what Ralph has announced about locality budgets, can I, can I thank you for that? It's something that my group has been pressing for, uh, given the initial indication was that we would have additional funds for that. My only slight concern in the report we had, or some of us certainly had, and I think all of us had it last week from, from John Birch, was that some members had yet to allocate any money out of the locality budgets. Uh, and I'd certainly welcome the extra 5,000 to be able to support COVID-19 activities of groups, uh, providing it's going to go to that. It's not just going to go out elsewhere that members haven't allocated. I think 10 members, as of last week, had yet to allocate any money to any local groups, which is a slight concern, I have to say. OK, thanks, I, Stephen. I have, then, I have then a series of questions on paragraph five onwards, going through section by section. Uh, but perhaps you want to deal with wrap these questions to Ralph and the finance ones first. Yeah, so I mean, in, like, as I said to you, Stephen, um, on chat that we are running this like a panel. So um, hopefully um, some of those questions um, we can deal with quite quickly. But yeah. we don't we don't want to have a, such a long conversation as we had at the last meeting because I allowed that one to as a real proper conversation, we do we do have some other business that we really must go through um, in relation to um, business we have to pass through this. It, it, indeed, yeah. Theresa, but we had a briefing meeting yesterday with officers. We raised all these questions with officers yesterday uh, and I'd like to expect them to be answered today. So the officers have been given advance notice of all the questions certainly I've raised and members of my group have raised. Uh, OK. So, so um, I will just say in relation to um, the locality budgets, I know that Terry Duras, who is responsible um, for uh, locality budgets, um, has been uh, corresponding with colleagues. So um, obviously locality budgets are a, a, local, um, a member's own um, responsibility, but we'll certainly look into that and I hope they do, do um, make some grants. Obviously, they've got to be approached as well. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Shouldn't be too difficult. Um, so, is Scott, are you there? Could you ask the answer the finance question, please? Okay, <clears throat> I can. Morning, uh, councillors. Um, uh, the, uh, the issue regarding the twelve million pound pressure um, that we uh, were seeking clarification with the NHS over. Uh, my latest understanding, although I think there's still negotiations that are ongoing, is is that there's a likelihood that that pressure will need to be met by HCC. I think when we last reported to you, I think there was a, a higher expectation that the NHS would meet those costs. I think that that swung more um, against the pressure to the county.
City Council. So um, I, w I won't um, um, preempt the outcomes of those negotiations, but um, probably from a risk point of view, I would highlight to members that the more of that risk is likely to fall on on our funding uh, streams. And if, if you would like, uh, uh, Councillor Heritage, um, I can just clarify that uh, the uh, on the locality budgets, um, the £5,000 um, extra is expected and will be ring fenced for COVID um, own, a COVID related only applications. Thank you. Okay, somebody has a phone ringing. <laughs> yes, it's mine. Sorry, it's just stopped. <laughs> okay, fine. Thanks. So, Stephen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through other members who've got questions, and I'll come back to your list. Okay, so get everybody have a chance. So, I've got Drida, Steve, Jarvis, and Joshua. OK, uh, thank you uh, and uh, I welcome the extra money um, from central government and also like to um, add to the um, support and thanks for our, our team um, at County who have been doing such a, a great job to support the community in very difficult times. Um, one of my questions is about the money that's coming to, um, to uh, local government and uh, it it relates really to um, us, those of us that are uh, three, three hatters, because uh, much of um, Hertfordshire is in parished, and I know my own parish council is doing a great job in supporting local people with our Good Neighbour scheme, and I know Terry that in Har Harpenden you have a very similar scheme. But at the end of the day, um, the finances for our parish council are looking very, very grim, and I do hope some of that money that has been um, allocated will trickle down into the third tier. Um, my question is um, in regards to testing, and we know from central government that um, schools uh, are quite likely to open soon with some year groups um, going back into school. And I just wonder, um, have we had any guidelines from central government on testing arrangements or um, safety guidance for teachers and other workers in our school system? Thank you. Okay. So, um, Scott, are you able to comment on third tier funding? And um, who is Jim on the line? Can you comment about testing uh, teachers, please? And other workers in schools. And other school workers, yeah. yeah. OK, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to parishes, um, the, the position that we've always held um, at the County Council and I believe with the districts is, is that it will be up to the parishes to sort of initiate uh, sort of first contact in relation to the financial pressures that they're facing and then individual discussions would take place. So there is no sort of wider redistribution of the funding um, that uh, the County Council and districts have been receiving that I'm aware of. Um, but I would just um, uh, promote really through today's meeting that uh, individual parishes would need to have those conversations uh, either with ourselves or the District Council. OK, great, thank you. Um, and um, Jim, I know you're there, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, Chair. And uh, the short answer is government hasn't yet issued clear guidance on this. Um, uh, and and we know it's coming, uh, but we do have arrangements in place for testing key workers um, and making the best of testing. There are multiple routes. And uh, when we have had that clarity, we will get advice and information out to all teachers and all schools through a variety of means, including direct text messaging. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now move to Steve Jarvis, please. Hi, um, section 6.6 .6 relating to um, children's services, education and schools uh, runs through a number of things that are that are happening. What it doesn't describe is what we're what the council is doing in order to uh, support schools. I think we had a discussion last time about um, the, the various ways in which they were providing free school meals, but there are also questions um, about the way in which they're going to um, manage activities in the latter part of the year once schools have resumed. What are they going to deal with in terms of providing additional support for those children who, who need it as a result of their time out of school? What are we doing to support particularly the smaller primary schools across Hertfordshire? in order to be able to react effectively to these things. OK, thank you. Um, 
I, I don't know if um, Jenny Coles or somebody from Children's Services is on the line. Chair, I'm not sure that we've got uh, a senior no. children's services uh, officer. I'll, I'll check, but I can say a, a few words. Uh, okay. But uh, I know the position is uh, is evolving uh, because uh, we're awaiting specific guidance from government about the plans. Um, uh, the detailed engagement between officers from the education team, Simon Newland, our director there, uh, has been working very closely with the with uh, Hearts for Learning. Uh, the uh, secondary school heads associations and the other heads associations and individual schools to uh, support them to start planning for potential scenarios. Uh, so uh, you'll have seen in the media various uh, speculation about what might happen in terms of which year groups and when. Uh, so we are continuing the support to schools to work through um, what that might mean in terms of uh, operation and safety and cleaning and testing and all those sorts of things. Mm. Um, and, and until we get specific guidance about what's going to happen, it's very hard to be specific about exactly how they'll operate. Uh, but uh, I'm assured, certainly from what I'm seeing, that there is very detailed engagement that's continuing between uh, education officers and all of the relevant uh, representative groups. But the moment that we have any more at all, I think it would be worth having a more detailed look at this area and share exactly uh, the, the nature of the work that's underway. Yeah. So, Owen, could I ask you to ask officers to perhaps put in the weekly uh, COVID bulletin to members what's actually happening at the moment, what conversations yes. they've had, so they've got that information. OK, yeah. lovely. Thanks very much. Um, so, Joshua, you're next. Thank you. Um, yeah, firstly, just want to echo thanks to all the council staff that have been going above and beyond at the moment. It's really, really impressive. So thank you all for that. Um, I've mostly written my question out in the chat log, so I'll just speak over the top of that. I know in the integrated uh, plan process earlier in uh, the year, in January and February, we highlighted the potential risk for care provider failure. Um, now, given the increased um, costs, uh, operational and otherwise at the moment uh, in relation to COVID. I wondered if someone could just outline in brief um, what plans are in place uh, to mitigate any potential uh, provider failing, because that would obviously be a, a, a tremendously difficult thing to deal with at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, do you want to answer that one, please? Yes, thanks. Uh, sorry, Chris Badger, I didn't introduce myself earlier, Deputy Director of Adult Care Services. Um, if we break that down, I think it's a, it's a really good point about the, 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 the importance of supporting that um, uh, strength of those providers. I think the first thing that we did uh, in late March was offer that financial support to providers and inject confidence into the sector. So crucial to that was guaranteeing cash flow based on three months of uh, invoices so that we could guarantee uh, payments uh, around um, uh, care costs that related to previous capacity. So if they saw a reduction in demand, we would maintain uh, payments at previous levels of demand, thereby uh, contributing significantly to security around cash flow. Also offers to pay for additional costs surrounding things like extra staff, PPE costs and so forth. I think secondly, one of the key things that we've done is to agree and set up a very uh, tight intelligence and surveillance system so that we're talking to providers on a daily basis so that we can monitor areas of risk, particularly around staffing, for example. Um, and then also as part of the financial package, providers had to agree to offer mutual aid to one another. So if a provider was uh, uh, experiencing problems, whether it be financial or around service um, impacts around staffing, for example, other providers are ready to step in and help. So far, that's not been uh, required. And finally, and I think more positively and probably more positively than we thought would happen, we've seen recruitment pipelines to care providers be relatively positive during this period. And indeed, a number of home care providers are reporting uh, recruitment pipelines that are far more positive uh, than they've seen for some years. Hopefully that gives some reassurance. So um, somebody has their mic on and they're typing. Could I ask that you turn off your mic, please, whoever's typing? Thank you. Um, so now I have got Colin, Colin Woodward. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, my question is around 5.4.3 Operation Shield and the impressive uh, 
distribution of uh, 10,870 food parcels and 301 prescriptions, which I know, um, being one of the Arts Constabulary volunteers myself, has now sort of more or less uh, almost doubled, I think. Uh, but coordination um, may be an issue. And um, I have heard of people getting, for example, food parcels that haven't needed them and then having some difficulty um, returning them or doing something else with them. And uh, there's obviously great work going on between uh, county districts, local community groups and food banks. Um, but my concern then um, is around uh, where there might be gaps, um, where if we've got duplication, there's potential that there are also gaps. I wonder if someone could clarify where we are uh, with that. Thank you. Um, Helen Manerf, please, can you respond? I can. Uh, good morning. Uh, I introduced myself. I'm uh, Assistant Director of Planning and Resources in Adult Care, but for the period of the coronavirus, I'm leading the volunteering and people assistance cell of the SCG, which is coordinating what we're calling Operation Shield and Operation Sustain. Um, just around the food parcel um, question, we are uh, the so the government has its own food distribution scheme and we have a, a similar scheme, a complementary scheme in Hertfordshire. With our scheme, we are calling before we send out packages to make sure that the package is required and that people are going to be there to receive the packages. That's our business process. Um, with the government scheme, that, that process doesn't, um, doesn't happen. So people um, may find that they are receiving packages that they no longer want. The process there is for the individual to contact the government and go through their call centre or their website and indicate that they no longer receive those packages. But I don't think that's particularly a very easy process to navigate. So I think there are some blips in the system at the moment, at this moment in time. Uh, we are now being uh, invited to regular meetings with MHCLG. I had the first of my meetings with them this morning. They've established a regional shielding team. Uh, so I think going forward, there'll be much better dialogue with councils to um, understand what the issues are and work together on, on solutions. Um, in terms of gaps, um, um, we are trying to make sure that gaps are plugged. So we sent out a letter to all Hertfordshire households uh, that came out um, over the sort of Easter period, over a few days over that period, setting out in that letter what people needed to do if they uh, if they if they needed support, not just if they were shielding, but if they were isolated and wanted some support at that time. So we're hoping by that method. We've reached all households in Hertfordshire and people know what to do if they do need support. The other thing we're doing is trying to match data across organisations. So working with district councils and health colleagues to pull together really a list, again, not just of shielded people, but of people who may be more in need of support more generally and to try and understand whether we've got names in common and how we're supporting those people. That's very much a work in progress, but it's um, a piece of work that we're trying to take forward. Uh, with uh, with appropriate speed. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. OK, so I'm coming to the second round of questioning. I'm, go I'm going to allow 10 more minutes on that. Um, colleagues, where um, officers aren't able to um, deal with all the questions that you have, and I suspect, Stephen, you have a whole myriad of them, um, they will ha happily respond outside the meeting. So I suggest that you pick those questions that are most pressing at this moment in time for response, but you will get a response. Um, so this is why you have briefings prior to meeting so that you know they can give you responses. So Stephen, would you like to ask your questions? And then I have another question from Ron Tyndall. So if you could take perhaps three questions, Stephen, and then Ron, please. Okay, I'm not terribly happy with this process, Teresa, because we, that's why we had a briefing. And I had expected the officers to give the answers as part of the introduction. I asked for an update on 5.11 in terms of the figures. Can we have that, please? Uh, 5.23, um, what is the supply chain and costings to the hospices, doctors and charities? Because it's increasingly unclear how some of these can actually get hold of the PPE uh, at a reasonable cost and indeed who is funding them. Um, I'll move quickly on, and it's related to uh, the delivery of the food parcels that Collins raised. Equally, I've had concerns uh, raised with me direct and the attempts to return food parcels, and it may well be the government scheme that Helen's just mentioned, uh, has failed in that they said if they return the food parcel, they won't get a free, they won't get a slot 
from a, a supermarket delivery chain and therefore they kept them. Equally, the food parcels in at least one case, it was a relative of mine, was unedible because their celiac and dairy free was never checked with them. And their attempt to ring up said, well, you'll just have to take whatever you, you're given. Uh, so what what are we doing to try and regulate that situation? Uh, 575, what's the position about the additional funding to citizens and advice and how is that being regulated and controlled? And indeed, are we involved within that? Quickly check if there's no others. Yes, there was one other in terms of well, a couple of others. Uh, in terms of the communication strategy, uh, mentioned here of the uh, MPs and the county councillors, no mention of district leaders uh, and get them getting the same information as the rest of us. So what is being done about it? I did raise that specifically yesterday. For instance, I'm aware that at least three district council leaders have not been given the same information about deaths in care homes that I have been given. OK, um, who would like to come back on that? Owen, oh, do you want to deal with some of those, please? Uh, yes, uh, as always, um, uh, officers uh, are working uh, incredibly hard and fast to try and get information uh, back. Uh, we'll see uh, which of those that we can answer uh, here, but uh, uh, unfortunately in the, in the 24 hours since that briefing, we may need a little bit more time. Um, so, um, Particularly uh, commun up, comms to other districts and borough leaders. Uh, so comms to, yeah, I mean, there is... Uh, regular comms going on to um, all, all different stakeholder groups uh, and the Hertfordshire leaders are uh, participating in a weekly meeting uh, so there is uh, plenty of opportunity to um, to raise any questions and to uh, discuss anything that, that hasn't come out. Um, all of the briefings that we've been sending out so for example the ones that we do for the MPs are immediately shared with um, all the district leaders, the, uh, the update that uh, Helen does from the um, shield and sustain work, for example, that also goes out uh, to all districts immediately. The SCG does a weekly update that goes out. So if there are specific instances uh, of things not being shared, uh, then uh, please do flag uh, and I'll, I'll uh, ensure that they're added to the list. Um, in terms of PPE, um, the PPE cell uh, underneath the strategic coordinating group uh, is working very hard, uh, including through the Hearts Care Provider Association that Chris Badger talked about, uh, to provide both guidance and advice about the, the appropriate use of it, uh, but also uh, to support uh, providers to get their hands on it. Uh, the main sources are we're encouraging providers to go through their existing supply routes wherever possible, and the majority of PPE is being supplied direct to providers through those routes. Uh, in addition, um, the PPE cell is able to source uh, some additional PPE and that's been distributed. And then as a final fallback, as a kind of emergency, uh, we originally received some uh, PPE directly from central government and that can be distributed in small batches on an emergency basis. Um, so uh, the majority of that uh, should be paid for by providers through the normal ways. Uh, there is additional support, uh, including through the financial support that Chris uh, mentioned earlier, uh, where um, we are providing uh, financial support to assist with that, some of that PPE and the emergency stuff that comes through LRF, well, that's just distributed free. Um, so there's a variety of um, um, uh, routes uh, that are being used. Um, so I just get distracted because uh, uh, it looks like somebody's screen sharing. Um, um, so uh, that's that on uh, PPE um, in... Just trying to think which, which other ones to pick up. Sorry, Susan, can I come back to you first? Uh, yeah, so um, we've got them. You've got the PP one. Um, I think Helen's going to come back on food parcels and CAB, yes. please. Yes, absolutely. yes. Helen. So, so, so on food parcels, particularly around dietary requirements, the government scheme is not set up to deal with individual specific dietary requirements. So people who have those requirements should have been referred to the HCC scheme where we are set up to meet those needs. Um, if there are any problems, then I can certainly um, take details and, and pass those on and we can do emergency um, provision if that's necessary. Um, again, around returning parcels, I, th I, I hope and uh, believe that those ones would be government rather than HCC ones. My suggestion is that those are passed back to food banks if they're no longer required. If people need help, 
uh, signing off the government list, then they can get in touch with Hearts Help and we can walk them through that process. Um, on citizens advice, the council has a, a business as usual contract with the citizens advice for them to provide crisis report, crisis response services for people that are in uh, financial or other sorts of crisis. That's worth 350k per annum. We've given the local citizens advice an extra 30k um, to deal with the sort of a coronavirus response period and we're, we're keeping that uh, funding under review. I don't have, I'm afraid, details of what the district councils are giving to citizens advice, but I can research into that and come back. OK, thank you. Um, and Scott, can you respond on the finance question? Uh, just, to, just to be clear, that, that was on the uh, on the business grants. 5.11. Just double check. Uh, I think. Apologies. I think I wrote down five point one one. Yeah, I'll sorry, I'll find my. Um, yeah, I've got that number of COVID cases five one one. Stephen, can you remind us which paragraph it was? Five point one or five point one one? It wasn't on business grants. It, it was on what was just been answered in terms of the systems and device and how they were getting the money and how it was going. So if we could have okay. it in the in the weekly update what's been sent to which system device because some of them are coming direct to us asking for grants and it were, we weren't to know until this report came out they were getting money direct from the government so that does seem yeah, to be sort of double funding going potentially going on yeah there that i think there is a lot because the government is funding in lots of different places and uh councillors need to stay alert to that but i think that um the weekly briefing we get from john birch does cover a lot of the relevant news yeah. that's going on nationally so we need to keep an eye on everything it's all getting a bit hectic at the moment there was an outstanding question that i did want to ask in terms of the child the report on the children said how many schools were open over i did tell officers yes yesterday over easter it was a question of how many pupils are in schools and what and it was a question raised at the last cabinet panel Theresa, as you recall what we are doing about getting vulnerable children back into schools when they weren't attending and how we are dealing with that with the school it's all with a well, having 260 schools open, but they've only got 260 pupils, was it really worth it if we can't get the pupils in? So um, I'll, I'll, I'll respond on that one. So um, we are gathering data and it's not as easy as it sounds, but um, we are, so social workers, if their children are known to us are either on uh, SIN plans or CPs, um, social workers are working with the families to try and get the children into school. Um, and um, but many parents um, are concerned about infection. So that that's mm. quite a challenge um, with the uh, children who are in care. Again, we're working with the, the social workers are working with the foster carers. Um, many foster carers are actually saying, well, our own children can't go to school. So it's not really fair that um, our foster children have to go to school. So they're they're working with them at home. So. Be rest assured we're doing what we can and the numbers are going up each week. Um, I, officers are putting together some data, which I know that we will be sharing shortly once they verified it all and it's and it's updated weekly. So I'll make sure that that goes out, which giving those numbers. But um, universal education wise, I said that's quite it's quite difficult to keep a line on that. I do know that um, and it varies from school to school. So, again, it varies with um, head teachers. Um, but, but schools are actually following up on their own vulnerable children as well. So um, and I've heard of um, an instance in uh, Stevenage where the teachers are, have gone around and knocked on the door and asked to, at a safe distance, to see the children. So um, it's being covered in a variety of ways. So um, I've been getting regular briefings on that and I'm I am fairly content that we are protecting all our vulnerable children as much as we can on that. So um, I'm now just going to ask get Ron to ask. So as I said, Stephen, all the questions you raised yesterday, you will get a written response to from officers. Um, Ron, you're the final questioner, please. Very quickly, Terry, uh, Terry Hone mentioned that uh, there were waste centres opening on Monday, uh, household waste and recycling centres opening on Monday, and wondered whether or not he would confirm what, uh, why Hamill Hempstead will not be one of those, please. Terry? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, Ron, uh, the sites have been selected 
based on access and the ability to maintain safe distancing. There's a number of sites and the best we have chosen is the best 10 where we can control access safely and we can control on site safely. And best assured officers have gone around and looked at every site and have excluded some because they believe that if we did open them up, we would not be able to maintain the safety of, off of the operatives, nor the safety of the public visiting, nor traffic. So these 10 sites have been selected because they are the bigger sites, um, but uh, they have been selected and also so we can manage them in an appropriately a safe environment. OK, thanks, Terry. OK, so um, I think we've come to the end of this particular item on the agenda um, and um, members are asked to note this report. I'll take it that everybody is happy to note the reports and I continue to give the undertaking that officers will respond to questions from the other groups. OK, shall, shall we move on? Thank you. And can I remind members on the call here today that if you are not speaking, please turn off your microphone because we can hear everything that goes on in the room that you're in, including you turning papers. So that'd be really good if we could do that. And um, if I could also ask members not to screen share because we don't need to see members emails on the screen either so you need to be a bit careful with what you're doing on your laptops um so now moving on to item three supporting adults with complex needs strategy yeah that's the right one um and um could i ask helen Manerf to do a presentation please thank you chair um, so in overview, Chair, um, we know uh, that for us as human beings, housing is crucial to our well-being. This report proposes new principles for supporting people who find it difficult to access and sustain accommodation um, to help them with that overall well-being. The Council spends around £4.7 million a year on services that support people to, to, to sustain accommodation and typically those people have complex needs that are difficult to uh, to work through really. Um, this funding, this 4.7 million, originated uh, with the County Council back in 2003 when uh, funding was removed from districts and made over to the Council under the Supporting People initiative. Um, a big development in, in the sort of history here is the Care Act 2014, which clarified HCC's responsibility around housing. The Care Act sees housing as fundamental to well-being. It treats housing not just as bricks and mortar, but as, as the support that people need to sustain that housing and sees a vision for delivering care and support in an integrated way, not only with health partners, but also with housing bodies. Um, housing related support, this funding stream, is there to ensure that people with a range of support needs can live as independently as possible in the community. It tries to um, allow them to, uh, um, to sustain that independence and avoid the development of more extensive, uh, more critical needs. So in that sense, it's very much a preventative funding stream. The current situation that we have in Hertfordshire is that um, the, the provision is uh, based on very historical lines dating back to that 2003 change in funding distribution. Provision differs where you are in the county. There can be duplication and overlapping of funding with different funding bodies putting money in. Um, different models of provision, different approaches in different places. And people with complex needs sometimes find it difficult to navigate this system and may, as a result, fall through the cracks in our provision. Um, this strategy aims to put in place the principles, really, for better working across the piece with partners around this area. Uh, we want very much to be um, evidence-based in, in our allocation of funds, and so um, the strategy is supported by a joint strategic needs assessment which summarises the existing data that we know about um, homelessness and how people who are homeless often have needs for care and support. Um, the strategy uh, aims to address the disparities to be uh, leading towards redesigned service models. It talks about piloting new ways of working, which would typically see a case coordinator working with individuals to help them get access to the support and care that they might need in a much more um, straightforward way than currently may exist. 
Um, so I would just add a note of caution in that this is a complex partnership environment and making change in that context um, can be challenging. I would also say that um, during the period of the coronavirus response, we've actually been operating almost a, a kind of pilot, um, not in the Broxbourne area as discussed in the paper, but generally by bringing together an accommodation cell, uh, which has been tasked with trying to house rough sleepers and rough sleepers typically have uh, often care and support needs. It brings together housing colleagues and also colleagues from HPFT, from adult care services, from public health. So actually we're, we're seeing some of that way of working right now during the coronavirus period and I'm hoping that we can build on that um, as we go forward uh, once the strategy is agreed. Once the strategy hopefully is agreed by Cabinet, then the next steps will be a detailed discussion post the coronavirus period in each locality to develop the next steps before starting then a commissioning process. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, could I ask Richard Roberts to make a few comments, please? And then I have Ron. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I thought I might come in later, but why, why, why not offer a few comments up at the start? No, I um, you can come in later too. <laughs> OK, um, well, I don't want to reiterate what, what Helen has said, okay, but this paper... Fine. OK, I suppose fundamentally this paper um, gives us an opportunity to really be a bit more flexible, uh, particularly around the Broxbourne um, pilot scheme, a bit more flexible, bring in a multidisciplinary team, make it more efficient, but really fix it around accommodation and making sure that the support is around the accommodation. And I think that's what um, the, there's far less passing from one uh, agency to another. I think, as Helen said, this rather more uh, coherently than I did. But that seems to be uh, almost a, a message coming out of COVID, really. We cannot have a bureaucracy that doesn't cut to the, the point of need as fast as possible and hold people uh, in the best possible place, as opposed to drifting into uh, worse circumstances. Um, and I think post COVID, we may see more need, uh, which we will need to address and efficiently and effectively. Thank you, Chairman. I may come in later. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Richard. Ron. Hi. Thank you, Terry. Yes. And also I'd like to thank Helen uh, for the briefing yesterday and also the uh, extra documents that have now been sent to me. And also thank you for acknowledging yesterday that there are some issues with the data in the EQIA uh, and that we do need far more data and, and, and explanation for what we're dealing with. But generally, I'm supportive of this uh, initiative. I think going forward, it's, uh, it's something I think needed in every area. So I'm hoping that we don't just have the pilot and then it suddenly grinds to a halt as some other pilots in the past have. We get one pilot, we have one area in nine months Fantastic work by everybody, and then nothing happens follow. Um, but that, unfortunately, is the, the where the funding is coming from, and that involves the government, and I won't go any further into that. What I'm particularly concerned about is my experience in this field, particularly in decorum, where for 14 months we've been trying to get extra me mental health facilities, is that where we have individuals where they have multi- multi problems of drugs, alcohol, as well as mental health, they tend to sometimes slip through the cracks because sometimes the providers of mental health don't like dealing with people with alcohol and drug problems. And then they're passed from uh, the different services and they never get the right treatment. So I think it's something that we need to grasp at an early stage to ensure that whatever offer is made to these unfortunate people who we're trying to help that we actually help them with all of their problems and don't just exclude them on the basis that we can't deal with it. And I think that's important. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Ron. So, Helen, do you want to make any comments? Um, yeah, so on the data, I suppose that the reason why it's difficult is because there was um, obviously when the Homelessness Reduction Act came in in 2017, there was a change from one system of collecting data into a new system. And as yet, it's not uh, very well embedded. That data is collected by the district councils. Uh, uh, we are working with them to try and 
um, make sure that we've got all the data we need. So that's very much a work in progress and is one of the reasons why we don't want to rush into um, a commissioning exercise without doing more detailed work around that. Um, around mental health, I know Jim uh, is able to comment, but I would say that in the pilot and also in the accommodation um, cell, which is operational at the moment under the coronavirus, we have got HPFT around the table. HPFT were involved in the discussion around uh, developing these strategic principles. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can make sure that they're um, fully engaged going forward. OK, thank you. OK, um, can I just say I think this is a particularly good piece of work and I'm very interested in people with um, having worked with them over many years at multiple needs. I mean, that really is um, a difficult problem that and it's a, what one might say is a wicked problem that we need to try and grasp. And it'd be really good if Hertfordshire is at the forefront of trying to do that work. So I, I, I really support you on that one. Um, so Jim, you're just saying you would like to comment on drugs and alcohol and mental health. Jim? Jim, would you like to comment? No, no, okay. All right, lovely, fine. To Richard, did you want to say any more? Um... Uh, thank you, Jim. Just, just to, uh, I, I welcome the support. Um, I'd like to thank Sukhvinda Rai for uh, pulling this report together, which uh, Helen has presented this morning. I think that, uh, reiterating what I said earlier, uh, I am uh, really excited about innovative ways of bringing together the expertise that will support people who are really struggling, um, whether they've lost accommodation, they've lost their job, um, they've just circumstances are such that they are struggling um, with uh, potentially finances, with their accommodation, rent, etc. And we know that those um, that come to our attention, uh, about three to 4,000 every year across the county, that more than half of them have supporting needs. Uh, come back to Ron's uh, mental health need, uh, but uh, drug and alcohol uh, relationships, um, a, a, whole, a whole range of issues. Uh, and, and dealing with those effectively within the support of accommodation. That's the fundamental part of this. Making sure the accommodation is secured and then dealing with the additional needs uh, in an effective way. Uh, this is, I, 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 just to answer Ron's question, this will not just be a pilot, Ron, um, but as the data stands, Broxbourne is a bit of a standout in terms of its need, and therefore I think it's a good place to start to look at this uh, in detail. Uh, and some districts as well, it, is, it should be stressed, already have very good um, um, support around homelessness and those falling into the uh, into that territory. Um, so Broxbourne is a good place to start, but we will uh, work on that, uh, bring further plans back from that pilot and certainly through my panel. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So colleagues, um, I'm now moving to the recommendations and the recommendations are, and I'll read them. The special cabinet panel is invited to note the information contained within the report and recommend to cabinet that Cabinet agrees the Hertfordshire Supporting Adults and Complex Needs Strategy. And two, the Special Cabinet Panel is asked to recommend to Cabinet. Truth, cabinet sorry, I, I indicated that I wanted to speak. Oh, sorry, I didn't. You, I, but, you're, sorry, you're, I put my hand up. Is it, is it possible just to say a few words before you continue with the recommendations? OK, what you need to do, I think, Dreda, is sort of, I don't know, You'll either have to knock the camera so I can see you because I okay. couldn't, didn't see you then. No, that's okay. okay. So I, I appreciate the part of it is my lack of technological skills. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just want, I, I very much welcome this report and it was interesting to see this sort of inconsistencies uh, across Hertfordshire um, in, in relation to um, the district council support for homeless people. And um, I very much welcome that we're looking to better consistency. Um, I totally um, agree with Ron that sometimes that the problems that we have um, with people with substance abuse are too difficult perhaps um, to deal with and therefore they kind of get um, pushed to one side. Um, and I, I very much um, 
always wanted to see better provision, particularly for women um, who have substance abuse difficulties, because I think we have to acknowledge that not everybody wants to be treated. Um, that, uh, and we have to make provision for those people. And often homeless accommodation will not take people in um, if they have um, alcohol or, or drug abuse difficulties. So I as I say, I think we do have to acknowledge that, that there is a section of the community quite difficult to deal with, but who actually d don't see a way immediately out of their um, abuse difficulties. Uh, and we also have to um, try and accommodate them within our system. Thank you. Okay, fine. Thanks very much, Drida. I think we agree with that. Absolutely. Um, hear that one very clearly. Um, so um, if I might continue. So I'm going on um, a recommendation to the special cabinet panel is asked to recommend to cabinet that cabinet agree a planning period to help shape commissioning intentions in discussion with stakeholders. Um, please, could you signify if you agree in some form or if you disagree? Thank you. Thank you, Drude. I got that one. I think we've all agreed on that. Yeah. OK, that's fine. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. So that's approved. Um, so now moving on to item four, which is um, assistive technology county wide, the county wide service. And um, Helen, you're again going to present to us. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this paper concerns the future provision of community alarm services at the end of the current SMS contract. Um, and just to recap for members, there are currently two um, services that we operate for Community Alarm. One of them is delivered by North Hearts Care Line, which is a, um, an operation that's managed and, and organised by North Hearts District Council. The other one's delivered by Serco as part of the HCC SMS contract. And to all intents and purposes, there is not a lot of difference between those two services. Um, and the proposal is that as of the end of the SMS contract, we bring both services together. So we have a, a common operation, um, a clearer pathway for people who want to access community alarms, uh, and we reduce some of the managerial duplication that exists in the current uh, arrangements. Um, when we take the service, if Cabinet agree into this new arrangement, we will still be able to organise and um, um, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that we've been, uh, members probably know we've been, been doing a lot of work to pilot assistive technology and nothing that we want to do in this in this proposal is going to stop us developing our digital assistive technology offer. Indeed, North Hearts Care Line have been one of our key partners in the piloting work that we've been doing. Uh, I think the final thing to say is that we've had a very good working relationship with North Hearts, Hearts Care Line since 2015. Uh, when this was first established uh, and they've been very responsive and resilient. They've invested heavily in their um, in their communication centre, their call centre uh, and during the coronavirus period they've been working remotely and they've sustained and upped their service during that period. So Chairman, the, the, the proposal is to combine those two, two services as of April 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Nobody has indicated that they want to speak on this one. Does anybody want to speak? Ron. Right, sorry, very quickly, just, just to say no problems. I just think this is definitely uh, well thought out and I do uh, encourage it. It also by bringing it into one provider uh, we have a better relationship with, I think will mean that we can actually adapt it to our own purposes going forward for the benefit of the users and ensure that we give the best service we can and also be, uh, keeping it as up to date as we can. So no problems from our, our side. Great, thanks. Drida? Yeah. No? no? Okay, fine. Um, Richard? Chair, very, very briefly, I think this is uncontroversial uh, for the reasons that that, that, Holland, uh, that Helen has said. Um, 
but it is an absolute lifeline um, that we, we we should recognize how important the pendant service and the response that people get to it. It does enable people to maintain independent lives at home with the confidence, not just for themselves, but for their families as well, that there is somebody at the end of a phone who can come and call and make sure uh, that um, uh, emergencies are followed up. So it is, as, as Helen said, this should not be conflated uh, with fancy uh, AI and assistive technologies. This is our day-to-day -day currently existing uh, and um, this paper uh, effectively um, is, is about uh, bringing those two together and, and providing a slightly more efficient service. So with that, thank you, Jim, and I'd recommend it. Thank you. That's great. great. Thanks, Thanks very much, everybody. Um, we have um, four recommendations under this one. I'm not going to, um, they're all set out um, in your agenda. I'm not going to read them. Um, given the conversation we have, I'm assuming, please, if I may, that we are all agreed on these um, recommendations. Please, could you just quickly indicate if you're not really? <laughs> I think we're there. OK, lovely. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So it's the Helen show today. Um, so um, item five on the agenda is changes to transport provision for voluntary day services. Um, could I ask Helen to uh, again present? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so uh, very briefly, this paper proposes some changes to uh, charges for a number of people who currently use um, transport to attend some uh, some services. These typically are services like lunch clubs. Um, and the group affected aren't people within the eligibility of the Care Act, so they're they're accessing services, I guess, on a prevention basis. Uh, and there is a there's been a historical anomaly here, whereby 15 of these services are currently operating without any form of charging, which is unequal really to how we would normally assess and charge for transport to other um, services. So the paper proposes that we introduced, uh, introduce some charges for, for these journeys. Um, the proposals have been the subject of quite extensive consultation with the group affected, as reported in paragraphs five and paragraph six of the report. Uh, and I guess reflecting on the concerns and the feedback from um, that consultation process, uh, the proposal before members is that um, uh, we introduce charges on a phase basis. So in the first instance, um, until July 2021, a £2 per journey charge, thereafter mirroring the dial-a-ride uh, charging scheme. Uh, members probably have noticed finally that um, in the EQIA section of the report, section seven, um, I think actually there's a bit of cutting and pasting uh, error there. Um, but I would assure members that the EQIA, which accompanies the report, um, fully articulates the equalities implications and the mitigations that are proposed. Thank you, Chen. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? So I'll take Ron then Drida, please. Sorry, back on mic. Uh, yes, certainly. I I have mixed feelings about this. I, I agree that we should have a standardised services across the county. However, uh, I don't know how long these historic uh, exceptions have been allowed, but they should have been picked up ages ago. Uh, but I'm pleased they're doing now. What I'm concerned about is the is when it is finally rolled out uh, in 2021 there could be an implication of uh, those with the longer distances having quite a lot of money to pay. And I would like some attention paid on that and to ensure that any, any of the 236 users who have the longer journeys are, are, are dealt with as individuals because I feel we have a duty towards them, uh, especially as sometimes this is their only lifeline to getting out. But the other thing, and Helen mentioned the EQIA, there is on page 150 of the EQI mention of the concerns about it could lead to carer breakdown. Now we do as a service, like the same with across the county, uh, across the country, 
have to rely an awful lot on carers to fill the to actually fill their vital service in supporting users and if there is going to be any substantial care or breakdown this could actually destroy the whole ethos of the service so I think that's the other important issue that needs to be minded going forward. I've, I've had mixed feelings about this. I think ultimately it's the correct thing to do, but I do believe there is some serious concerns that need to be addressed in connection with the individuals in some cases. Mm -hmm. Helen? Uh, well, what I would say is once the decision um, has been uh, made, then we'll be going to communicate the outcomes of that to individuals by letter. We'll offer them the opportunity to have a discussion with us. And if there are questions of hardship, we will certainly be um, responsive to uh, helping people in in those circumstances. Um, around carers, um, clearly if, if um, there is a risk of carer breakdown, we want to see um, a Care Act assessment for the carer to understand how we can best support the carer and the individual really. Um, so those existing um, processes that we have will be very much brought to bear. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Drida. Uh, yes, uh, like Ron, I've got sort of mixed feelings about this, but I understand the necessity for some sort of consistency and it's a pity it hadn't been picked up before. Um, but uh, also, um, uh, going along with what Ron was saying about um, the individual's um, uh, perspective. I'd be concerned about the impact it may have um, in more negative terms for people uh, living in rural areas uh, where their uh, facilities may not be so close by and therefore they may end up having to, to pay more and that seems to be unfair to me. Um, and also, uh, how is there going to be some sort of feedback um, from monitoring about how um, the uh, charges may impact on the use of uh, daycare facilities, lunch clubs, etc. Helen? Uh, we can certainly do do that monitoring. We, uh, are, in terms of the impact on individuals and the prices or the costs that they would have to pay, the charges, um, I think there's a section in the report, I uh, can't quite put my hands on the on the paragraph number, but um, which discusses that the average impact is going to be no more than three pounds per journey. And clearly there will be some people who, who would have to pay more. Um, but again, I would refer back to our, our my response about the hardship process that we're envisaging. Um, Richard. Thank you, Chairman. I've just picked up uh, Josh's point uh, from the consultation. Um, and, and I would just say that sort of that suggests to me that 60% uh, are OK with this. So the majority are OK with these changes. Whilst I absolutely accept the concerns being expressed, uh, uh, is it, this is a change for people. And it is a change for those for whom their day centres are a vital link uh, and, and for their for their carers, but for their for their own um, uh, support during the day. Um, and I know from, for example, day in the day centre in the park, which is in Hemel Hempstead, they offer uh, hairdressing, um, uh, Ooh, personal support, uh, and 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 and, 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 a, and a range of activities as well as a hot meal. And, and those things are vital for people to access. But I think this is an appropriate way to bring about that change. Mm. It is just two pounds a day for the first year. And then it's the same as for everybody else. This is only 15 day centres across the whole of the county. So it's not huge. Uh, it, it's it's not the majority of people. And I think but it it, it I'm not going to get say this right. It regularises uh, mm. how everybody can access Dialeride, and I think whilst we still subsidise Dialeride, Dialeride significantly by tune of about sixty thousand, something like that. Uh, but it, but I think it sustains Dialeride, which is important across the county. Mm. I will just pick up with Helen um, at some point in the future about the rural issue and whether those in the rural areas can access day centres or any other community activity for that matter. I think it almost comes back to how we do community wellbeing and, and our support for the vol sector. But I think that's for another day. Um, this, I, I personally think this is is the way forward, uh, an appropriate way forward. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Does anybody else want to um, comment? Not seeing anybody indicating. 
OK, thank you for that. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I think this is the way forward. And I'm, I'm reassured that you'll be working with each each person that uses it. So I think that's important that we do hear the individual stories, as it were. Um, so that's excellent. Thank you very much. So the recommendation before before us is the special cabinet panel is asked to note and comment on this report and recommend to cabinet that cabinet approves the new chair charges be phased in from the 1st of July 2020. Um, are we all in agreement? Is there anybody that disagrees? Could have anybody indicate, I think, if they disagree? Uh, it's just the July 2020. I assume it's obviously subject to what's happening with COVID because we may not be in a position to run this service, of no. course. Uh, so I'm assuming that flexible July is going to be a flexible date subject to what is happening. So can we paraphrase that differently? Well, I think every, I think life is paraphrase, paraphrase completely, isn't it? Um, so yeah, that's that's logical, Stephen. Yeah. So I think we'll leave it at 2020 for now because we just don't know what the government's going to do. Um, but obviously we will have to uh, change things um, if we need to. And that, that, that's that's as taken. Um, so so I have one person against, but the majority are for. So that is passed. Thank you very much. Um, so we are um, now moving on to um, paragraph, paragraph six, item six, I should say. Thank you. Uh, this, this item is the, um, in relation to the procurement of a delivery vehicle for the emerging urban extension at Bulldog and the proposals on the governance arrangements to take the project forward. Um, and I'm going to ask, if I may, Mike Evans, who is Head of Development, to um, make representation, please. Morning, all. Morning. Um, so, uh, Bald Dock um, is um, probably our largest property development project uh, as we are going forward. Um, we are working with North Hearts for an allocation in their local plan. Local plans likely to be adopted it's it's uh, probably summer next year, so we're a way off yet. Um, but the allocation is very, very likely. Um, the scale of this development is is very large. We're talking about three and a half thousand houses and um, 60,000 square meters of employment space. So it is place shaping. That's I think that's the key point of this project as opposed to uh, smaller uh, projects that we've got on our books. So we need to work with a partner that's got place shaping um, uh, expertise. And we've explored with our joint venture partner, Chalk Dean, Morgan Sindel, um, whether they, they can do it. And they'd certainly have got the technical abilities to build the roads and the utilities and the landscaping and certainly the houses. Um, but the, the, the market testing that we've done um, suggests that there is a proven marketplace out there that have built um, and, and shaped such places. Uh, to create this community uh, spirit that not only is is beneficial to the community but of course adds value to the place as well so the recommendation is that we need to go to the marketplace um, we need to given the scale of this we need to go through an oju competition so um, we will run the competition in two stages we will select a short list of parties to work to to dialogue with by july so probably about four, no more than five, and we will dialogue with those parties, hopefully in a non-COVID world. But if we are in a COVID world, we can still dialogue virtually with them. Not ideal, but it is doable. We're all with the primary objective of um, appointing, certainly identifying, ideally appointing this development partner to work with us um, by Christmas. That would allow then the incoming master developer to work with us and of course North Hearts to work on any modifications to our current uh, uh, master plan document with a view of um, early starts on site um, uh, as, as early as possible as soon as the local plan is adopted. In the meantime we will be um, starting on site with Chalk Dean on some sites that are deliverable in planning terms, non-green belt sites, so there'll be 50 units coming through Chalk Dean. Um, but the recommendation is that we go to the marketplace to identify a an experienced master development partner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I ask um, uh, Ralph um, whether you wish to make any initial comments? 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Teresa. Um, uh, I, uh, I I'll reserve some some time later on just to, to deal with any issues that come up. But I think the, the 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 principle here is that we are seeking to get the very best um, advice that we can uh, manage to acquire in the marketplace. Someone who has uh, a significant experience uh, of shaping uh, developments such as this to ensure that th this our largest and most complex uh, scheme coming forward has the very best chance of succeeding. Uh, and I think um, uh, providing our, our ourselves with the ability to test the market and to uh, and to match uh, skills and uh, opportunities to our uh, particular project would be the best way of ensuring that uh, that success. So that's uh, that's my initial comments. OK, thanks, Ralph. Um, so I've got three speakers at the moment. I've got Steve Jarvis, Terry Hone and Bob Deering. So Steve, please. Thanks very much. Um, I agree that uh, we need to do something along these lines for this uh, development. I think the the is it the 50 house development that Mike Evans talked about is I think no part of this. We're not we're not talking about the delivery vehicle being applicable to that. That's really a uh, a separate development. It just happens to be next to the 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 one that we're that's the subject of this. But I think my my only concern about this, having accepted that the principle is a good idea, is we've talked many times about the need to ensure that the development on the edge of Bulldog achieves the right objectives, um, not just financially, but from a, a place point of view and from an environmental point of view. And clearly, the way in which we select the partner will have a critical impact on our ability to do that. So I'm concerned that we have some visibility of how we're going to, the criteria we're going to use uh, to select a partner that's capable of meeting all those objectives. Um, I'd say not just the financial ones, but the place related ones uh, and the ones related to the, the environmental performance of whatever we build as well. So can we have visibility of how that process is going to work and the details of, of how that, of, of, of those criteria? Clearly not today, but before the process is complete. Okay. So, Mike, do you want to make any comment? I, and I believe SAS is on the call as well. Anybody want to make any comment on that or just take that one away? Uh, yes. I, I, yeah, you, you go ahead, SAS. Thank you. Um, just to provide uh, reassurance that um, as part of the process, we are um, ensuring that there is substantial member engagement uh, at key milestones of the procurement process. As you can imagine, an OG procurement process does take several months and involves lots of key decision points. And um, uh, Councillor Sangster is very keen to have um, a member engagement at key sort of decision points along that way, along that route. In addition to that, we're more than happy to share the procurement documentation and the, the evaluation criteria. And that might be something that might be um, quite useful to Councillor Jarvis in terms of ensuring that he is content with the level of scrutiny we're putting around the environmental credentials and also the place shaping credentials of whomever we select. Um, we're all very um, clear as officers that these are two really strong uh, criteria that we need to consider and make sure that they can deliver on. I think if I can just come back on that, the other issue is, of course, the, the governance of the rollout. This is going to take a substantial amount of time. Things will inevitably change during that process, and we need to make sure uh, that the, the processes by which changes are are managed and monitored by the County Council uh, is built into the uh, whatever we procure. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. OK. Great. Thank you. Um, got Terry Ho next, then Bob Deering, then Joshua. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, fully support what we're doing here it is, as a neighbour to this site and as someone who's heavily involved in another development of a thousand houses uh, in north of Letchworth. Uh, yes, what we are doing here is very, very important to make sure that we get the right people in in helping supporting develop developments of this size and the infrastructure goes with it because there are major roads, A roads and there are railway lines and there are bridges and all sorts of things around that particular neck of the woods which do need to, to have the pros, professionals. I'm not saying our staff aren't, but certainly developers who are used to doing those sorts of things and know how to do it and when to do it and how to keep the public engaged in that. That's a very important thing. The public engagement around the area, because they will want to say in it as well, 
particularly when it starts coming towards how you get onto the A1, how you get onto the 505, 507, etc., um, with issues around that. So welcome what's in here and look forward to it moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob Deering. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, yes, I want to um, endorse the approach taken to this as well. I think it must be absolutely right that we've opened up the role of master developer to a competitive process. That must be right for our taxpayers and for the potential residents of this um, of this development. Um, and I just also just want to uh, nod in the direction of Morgan Sindel. We obviously have an important relationship with Morgan Sindel through Chalk Dean. Um, and it seems to me that the approach uh, also um, is very respectful of Morgan Sindel because I believe I'm right to say that Morgan Sindel can pitch uh, to compete uh, for the role of master developer. They may or may not uh, succeed, but they can pitch. Uh, and it's also open to them to pick up um, uh, house building projects as part of the Bulldog, the, the larger Bulldog um, plan. I just like confirmation on that because I think if that is right, it's it's a very it's a very smart move uh, that the officers have, have, have developed for us here. Chair, if I may, would you like me to come back on that? Yes, I don't mind you all, Mike. Yes, that's fine. Um, Thank you. So, uh, yeah, just to provide you with that reassurance, we have had um, extensive conversation with Morgan Sindel um, and they would have an opportunity. I don't know whether they would um, seek to put in a tender, um, but, you know, they, they, they have an, an opportunity should they wish to do so. Um, but to provide you with the reassurance around the house building element, there is... Um, an option that we're looking at in terms of the ODU process in which we can have an option for them to directly um, be sort of uh, have the ability for them to directly access a proportion of the housing to do a direct build. So there would be the opportunity for us still to have that that positive relationship with them in terms of you know what the joint venture was all about when it when it was set up. OK, fine. Thank you, uh, Joshua. Hi. Uh, yes, first, I just want to apologise. I've been putting stuff into the chat log on the assumption that that was also public. So from now on, I'll just make sure I make my comments in person. Yeah, as well. that's lovely. Sorry, um, if you so on the yes, it's fine. The, no, just 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 to clarify. Um, so so on this, then um, I, I usually sit on the community safety uh, waste management uh, panel, uh, not not uh, resources. So perhaps this is uh, just for my personal clarification. But on the recommendation point three, um, it says that we will delegate to the director of resources in consultation with the exec member uh, that they will get the, um, the the right to approve this selection. I wondered if that's sort of common procedure, sorry, or for something as large as this, should it not be coming back to the panel for final approval? If um, if someone could comment on that, please. Yeah. So who wants to comment on that? Do you want Sass or do you want Quentin or Owen? Or Scott? Would somebody like to take that question on, please? Um, Chair, so around the yeah. delegation of, um, in consultation with the Cabinet Member of Resources and Performance, um, we was we had a view that um, this was very much a, a, a collaboration piece of work between members and officers, but essentially it was uh, an officer um an officer piece of work to to deliver over this over the next um 11 months and we felt that it would be as it was a basically we would have got to the og process and we would be um, putting forward the recommendation that this is the the part that we wish to use at that point there would have it wouldn't have been per se a decision point it would have been a a more of a an agreement point because members and others would have had input all the way through the process at those key milestones so that's why we felt it was more appropriate and also in terms of time scales for delivery to go for a delegated um, approval okay um ralph would you like to comment on this yeah, I'd just like to uh, echo uh, Sass's point, and that is that in the in in the process, which is going to be um, 
uh, scrutinized by members all the way along. There will, the OG process provides for setting up of a, of a uh, system which leads to a conclusion. In other words, the OG process itself is a, is, is a conclusion-led process. We wouldn't want to see member involvement in the final decision because otherwise we would may we may well become uh, subject to challenge by uh, uh, those who have not managed to be successful. What we want, however, is for members to be associated with the decision making through the process in terms of, of establishing the documentation, the criteria by which we make the judgments, etc. But we can't have member involvement in the final decision. And really, unless there's a real uh, exceptional reason why we wouldn't agree with the uh, outcome, Scott and I would probably not wish to uh, uh, um, uh, exercise anything other than a recommendation to approve. OK, noted. I mean, that has been the format on OJs that we've done in the past. So I, I concur with that. Um, OK, thank you. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this item? I haven't seen anybody indicate. Stephen, Stephen Giles Medhurst. Uh, thanks, Ruth. Yeah, thanks for that, Ralph. Uh, I just want to be clear in terms of the documents we have in front of us. Isn't very specific unless I have missed it, and that's entirely possible. You know, for it again, you have to have officers. How the member involvement is going to take place in this, because it refers to the members growth group at one stage. And then it refers to delegated to cabinet and the director and the executive member at another stage. So could you be very specific as to how members and obviously particularly obviously the local members and here I'm talking about Steve from my side will be involved in this process and because it's not clear in the papers. Sass? Yeah, thank you chair. So um Councillor Sangster and I met on Monday to discuss how members could be involved in the process and who should be as part of the governance arrangements. That's not included currently within these papers because we're still in the process of drawing up the all of the procurement package of papers in terms of timescales and key milestones. But um, it's anticipated that members would have sight of the procurement documentation. They would also be involved in the bidder presentation. So for the shortlisted um, delivery vehicles, they would present and that would include a presentation to members. We would also um, come back to members at the point where we have shortlisted um, which of those we would want to go through for a formal tender process. And then we would come back again um, at when we've made our decision on which which um, master developer we would seek to use. I can send you a document with the proposed um, points at which members would would um, be involved if that's useful. So the size of the member type working group or at the task group, what, what are we calling it? What sort of organisation is it? Who would be on it? Would it be the panel members or is it specifically selected members but because they live locally they're local members how how would have you thought through that there are going to be um two um governance arrangements so one would be officer led where we're talking about um the key sort of uh technical aspects of the bidder process so involve, involving the dialogue phase and we'd have specific dialogue meetings with key individuals in the council around specific themes such as finance or place shaping. There would also be the governance which is led by um, the um, sort of the member group if you like and that would involve interactions with the local members also in terms of the local council and etc where they would have an opportunity to talk about how they would like to see the place shaping aspects progress. But in terms of the actual OG process, we're keeping it quite tight in terms of officer involvement, but also um, Councillor Sangster would be involved, um, Derek would be involved in terms of their roles. And also we'd be reporting back to the corporate members growth group. OK, fine, thank you. Could I ask somebody to turn their microphone off, please? I can hear I children can in the background. Apologies, Teresa, that's my yours? microphone, but okay. I can... I'll let you off then. At home. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. I think I would be content with that if a summary of that could be added to the recommendation three, what, so it's 313, which has a summary that there will, that there's a confirmation there will be member engagement at these stages because the way it reads at the moment is basically the director and the executive member in those recommendations. 
and does not cover what we've just been told. Ralph? Sorry, just getting my, my, my kit up and running. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to have uh, an, an addendum a document prepared by staff in relation to member involvement added to the, uh, the list of documents. Um, she and I discussed this earlier on, and I think it's very important that particularly local members and local, uh, local authority uh, access to uh, influencing the, uh, the process is, uh, is uh, entered into. Um, uh, the final, dis as I said, the final discussions um, in terms of the outcome needs to be OG compliant, but get as much member involvement up front in terms of, of creating the documentation that's going to go out as possible. Okay, fine, that's great. So we we will put a form of wording together for that to cover that, Stephen, and SAS will uh, produce a document. Okay, so that that's taken. There'll be a, um, a point. 3.3 in effect uh, going forward. Um, is there any other comment from members here? No, okay, that's great. So we go, we move forward to the recommendations. They're as set out in your agenda with the addition on um, three, little Roman three, um, in relation to member involvement documents. I'll put that for now as a holding so, so that officers know what they've got to do there. So um, please, could you indicate if you do not agree with these recommendations? OK, I haven't got anybody disagreeing, I don't think, at this moment. Great, OK, that's approved then with that addition. Yes. Lovely, great. Thank you very much indeed. So um, moving on to item seven, um, this is um, item seven is options for Hertfordshire residual local authority collected waste post 2023. And I believe uh, Simon Aries, Assistant Director Transport, Waste and Environmental Management will be making a presentation. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair. I I'll keep this brief. I've got um, Matt King, who's Head of Waste Management, on the call as well. So when we get to debating questions, uh, Matt can chip in uh, if the questions are too complicated for me. Okay. Uh, just a little bit of context on the report. It arises due to the uh, unfortunate, in our my view, failure of the two planning applications for our partner Veolia for an in-county injury recovery facility. Uh, and this sort of naturally led on to us having to think of a plan B. Uh, let me just assure you, of course, during the time working with Veolia, we've always been uh, working on a plan B on the basis that we might not succeed with planning application. And the report brings forward the conclusions of that thinking following the termination of the contract with Veolia. So the report sets out really what we are recommending as a way forward post the expiry of our uh, bridging arrangement, which expire around about 2324. Um, the just draw attention a couple of bits in the, in the report because they give a little bit of a hint of where we might be heading in terms of that arrangement. Just just on the recommendation itself, the basic recommendation is we will go to the market uh, and ask them to provide a solution to our disposal of our residual waste. If you look at table three, um, just under 6.4, that shows our current uh, bridging or our bridging arrangements are going to be in place. As you can see from that, all our arrangements are out of county. Uh, the majority of them are injury recovery facilities. And as I say, while we don't know what we'll get when we go to the market later on, uh, that gives a slight flavour of where we might be heading. Likewise, um, the market consultation we did, I'm now looking at table five in the report, um, indicates when we spoke to the market, the kind of areas and technology they might be uh, coming forward with. What we found was that eight out of 10 of respondents all suggested energy from waste. Uh, that's not a surprise. 
Um, but I also want to say that when we come to go to the market, of course, we don't know what we will receive back. So I can't say now that we are heading to a solution that will be energy from waste or whatever. We will take uh, a procurement forward. We will look at uh, the most value for money, the most efficient, effect, effective and efficient bids and make a decision at that point in time, which is which is a way off, to be honest. As you know, we've got up to 23, 24, but procurement is complicated and it will take some time. Um, as a direct consequence of this, uh, and one important point linked to the recommendations is the failure of the energy recovery facility applications in Hertfordshire means we've got to develop our, trans, uh, our uh, transfer station network, in particular um, the, an eastern transfer station. Um, this is as a direct result of that failure. We were always going to develop or try and develop a northern transfer station uh, if we had had um, the latest application, which was in Hoddesdon. Uh, but uh, failure of the Hoddesdon application means we now need to develop an eastern transfer station. That's in the current integrated plan, a bid in there for £10 million. Um, suggested site uh, at the moment um, at the back of the underdevelopment warehouse or waste recycling centres, all subject to planning, of course, a long way to go on that. But that is a direct consequence. And we need to try and get that in place before we arrive at a solution for the 2023 procurement, uh, sorry, disposal and treatment of our residual waste. Um, just a final bit from me, uh, just draw attention to some of the finance information. Uh, we don't know how much this is going to cost. That's what the procurement is going to be all about. Um, but it is worth saying we spend £27 uh, million a year at the moment on disposal of household waste. That includes haulage as well and all the transfer arrangements. Um, uh, an early table you may have picked out in the table gives an indication of the amount of haulage we do at the moment. Again, without knowing what the solution is, we don't know whether that's going to increase or decrease. Um, I'd be surprised if it decreases. Um, I think it's more likely to increase. So what we're saying, and you'll see uh, again in the IP and in the finance section of the report, there is already a £2.9 million pressure in from 2021 onwards just to support our current bridging arrangements. Um, it is not impossible, uh, perhaps likely, that we will have to put further pressure bids into the IP, depending on what we hear back from procurement. We've said all along in terms of an in-county energy recovery solution, uh, it would have saved us potentially uh, upwards of £100 million over a 30-year period compared to what we think would have been the alternative. Well, we're now going to have to find out what that alternative is. Uh, and I sincerely hope actually it will cost us less than £100 million over 30 years. But until that procurement process is underway and concluded, we won't know the answer to that. Uh, but certainly, unfortunately, the expectation is it's going to cost us more money than an in-county solution would have done, which perhaps isn't a surprise. Uh, I'll stop there. As I say, I've got Matt on the call as well. So uh, depending on what questions are, we can share those between us. OK, fine. Thanks, um, Simon. Um, Terry, do you want to come in at this point? If I may, please, and then I'll come back in again if there's any questions. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yes, we've been through this process. Yes, I am equally disappointed that uh, we couldn't get our energy for waste facility in Hertfordshire, but uh, politically it didn't seem to work out even though we felt it was a, we had a great case uh, down in uh, for down in, in Hollison. But that being said, the major disappointment for us is in addition to not having a facility, is we have to truck all this material across our county and into other counties. These are lorries which are burning diesel oil, which are putting out fumes into the atmosphere and polluting it. From my perspective, and I th I'm sure I share, this is shared by other members of the, the community, in particular councillors, that this is not something which we really enjoy and have to uh, having to go through. So, whilst we would still like a energy for waste city in Hertfordshire, we really look forward to perhaps a, an MP saying he's only too pleased or she is only too pleased to have one on that patch. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, we're also looking at another alternative which may be possible, but is railroads. It is not as easy as it sounds, railroads, but. Uh, uh, because of the, the railway infrastructure in Hertfordshire and the, where the main lines go and the lack of cross-county west, east, east, west railroads. So, but it is something which we are looking into and seeing whether there is an opportunity there for us to use. At Rye House, there was a railway line there, which was going to take away residual, residual the, uh, the, burn, the, the cinders from the burn. So 
Um, that would have been very helpful because we could have done other things with that as well. However, that's history. Amen. Currently, we recommend we get on with this, we do it. It's going to take a fair amount of time, and we believe it's going to cost us money, more money, to uh, get these uh, these contracts in place because I think the uh, those companies which offer these services realise that most local waste authorities uh, will have uh, problems in the future and hopefully with reducing waste, which is what we are pushing for, reduce, reduce waste, uh, that may be helpful. But in the meantime, we have to put things in place. We have to put these in place and so we have no choice. Thank you. Thanks very much, Terry. Um, Stephen Giles Medhurst. Right, yeah, I'm on. Um, generally supportive of this because clearly it's our legal requirement to dispose of residual waste and we need to have a solution. However, from our side, we don't believe any contract should be longer than 10 years, but it should have an option for a further five years. Uh, the market clearly is changing. Uh, and to commit to a 15 year contract now or when, when we sign it, I think is over a long time frame, a 10 year with a five year option to extend. Picking up on Terry's point, this is very much our view. And you certainly when you look at the report uh, and the huge amount of haulage across county, particularly into Buckinghamshire, uh, this goes completely against our climate change agenda. Uh, and of course, there's no uh, an analysis at this stage in the report as to what effect that will have. Uh, we should be looking at reducing the journeys, uh, having waste transfer sites with pre-treated sheds for consolidated for onward transport. Uh, we should be looking at additional pre-treatment activities such as uh, mechanical biological treatment. Uh, and I know officers aren't terribly keen on this, but other authorities are looking at that and increasingly looking at that on a larger scale. Uh, but obviously the key thing here, is, as, as Terry's already indicated, is having access from a waste transfer site to rail terminals in close proximity. And we should be investigating that further and doing research as to what could be feasible here. Uh, rail freight in this, probably to the north, whether we like it or not, is probably a, a better option in terms of the climate change agenda and economies of scale. Uh, and that needs to be covered in any further report that comes forward. Uh, and I, we, our side would certainly want these all to be looked at. Uh, similarly, looking at the proposals at individual locations to know whether we can bulk up uh, the waste for any transport that does have to be undertaken uh, by road uh, rather than just you know endless trucks uh, and actually looking fundamentally at what we have we've got the Waterdale Centre as our only one that we've really got at the moment we need to perhaps be looking more fundamentally what we've got in terms of our assets and, and reconfiguring those to make them more viable uh, as waste transfer sites uh, or expanding the existing one we've got. Simon, do you want to comment? I can uh, on a couple of those points. The 10 plus plus five is actually what we'd recommend. Uh, we wouldn't want to sign up for 15. Uh, 10 with a possible five year extension is exactly where we'd want to be. Uh, I agree on the, all the rail points, um, a better way of moving our waste wherever it's going to end up. Uh, we have to look at and we will look at. That will largely depend not just on our end of the world in half year as the county, but also where it ends up and how quickly or how we can get it from wherever it goes to the, uh, the disposal facility. On the technology front, um, we're not ruling anything out at this stage at all. Um, we will look at what the market brings back to us, um, and that could be uh, MBT. I suspect not, but it could be, uh, and we will make some decisions following that. Um, we don't think um, in terms of some of the solutions perhaps which could be done more locally, uh, anybody's going to be willing to try and build anything in Hertfordshire anymore. That message came back from the market consultation we did. Nobody really wants to try and put a large planning application in Hertfordshire for any kind of waste facility. Uh, and the final one on the assets and the transfer stations, uh, I agree. And the previous item uh, talked about uh, bulldog development. 
Uh, it's it's in the public domain. Uh, it's been talked about before. We are certainly looking at development of a northern transfer station, and one of the sites uh, within our uh, aim, if you like, uh, is within the, uh, our land owned by the county council on that boardwalk development. Uh, in a joint transfer station, a depot with the districts potentially, and a new household waste recycling centre. So we're always looking to maximise the use of land, simply because it's in such short supply for for waste activities. So absolutely agree that we need to make the most of our assets. Okay, thank you, Simon. Um, I've got Joshua, he's got a question. Thank you. So I'm having to unplug my headphones and then take uh, so, so that I can speak because my they, they tend to pick up as a microphone if I don't. Um, okay, no worries. Yeah, echoing some of the points that was raised by, by Stephen, um, it's really great that I'm hearing um, climate change repeatedly come up in relation to this, into this uh, on this issue. Um, I guess the only thing I'd, I'd want to say is the modelling in, that's done in figure one in this report shows quite a, uh, a noticeable increase over the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm not like I, I, I'm certainly not a, a professional um, waste modeller here. Um, it doesn't look too realistic. Um, and that's why I would also share the concern on the 10 to 15 year uh, contractual uh, lifetime, although that's 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 been covered. Um, the only thing I would say is when we're assessing the environmental impact of various options is that we take a, a, a through life approach to this. Uh, actually getting railroads back uh, back live and back into the system can be quite a resource intensive uh, process in itself. Um, and that when we're assessing the environmental impact of various options that we are taking into account, not just the uh, the option, not just the uh, the per trip um, uh, environmental impact, but also the setting up and uh, decommissioning impacts that are, that are associated with these large infrastructure projects as well. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to ask Matt, Matt King, if you can take on the question around uh, the volumes and the modelling. Uh, yes, happy to. Um, a specific reference was made to figure one in the, in the report. Um, just to note the wording ab above that does confirm that that is a cautious assumption on waste volumes. All that does is take where we are today and apply housing growth. Um, I'd refer members in this respect then to figure two, which is just below, which perhaps explains some of the challenges we have in modelling future growth with uh, any, any great degree of accuracy. Uh, figure two shows that um, when we start to take into consideration the government plans for uh, the resources and waste strategy target of 65% recycling by 2035. We could have a significant variety of um, uh, tonnage appearing in our residual uh, waste stream. Uh, what we do is uh, set out procurements that effectively cater for uh, all this approach, um, but uh, obviously we would plan and hope uh, and nothing would fetter our discretion in this respect to, to recycle as much as possible and uh, in line with those targets. OK, uh, can I just say here that um, uh, the work that uh, the county and the district and boroughs are doing, we're trying to work together around climate change. I hope that we would be able to uh, control and adjust and work with our residents to reduce the actual amount of waste that we have to get rid of. So um, uh, it's quite an exciting future coming, um, but we're not quite there yet um, with with the COVID, etc. But rest assured, Josh, um, that that's at the forefront of our minds. Simon, can you um, comment on some of the other points, please? Yes, so so the point Josh made uh, about taking into account whole system issues is absolutely spot on, and uh, you hinted at it there, Chair, as well, in terms of sustainability agenda. It's not just as simple as thinking which is the best way of moving waste. I mean, rail certainly adds up. The report does talk about that. Um, but, you know, what's going to go at the other end of each of those rail lines and what is the whole system cost? So one of the critical things we have to look at, uh, both in what is the technology and also the haulage, is whole system stuff. It isn't quite as simple as just thinking actually rail might be more efficient because there's less, um, you know, you load more onto rail than you can on road. If we have to put in infrastructure, and we all know rail infrastructure is massively expensive and complicated to get on the ground, um, the benefits might reduce. So whole system thinking, whole system cost is absolutely crucial. OK, great. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to say anything before I bring Terry home back in? Oh, sorry, Steve Jarvis. Sorry, I've got you on the list. Sorry, Steve.
Thanks. Um, yes, I mean, a couple of questions relating to um, the way in which we plan things like transfer stations. I mean, we've talked about the fact that the the uh, the technology that's used, the the um, the way in which the waste is processed is going to change. I assume that we need, therefore, to plan the transfer stations to be built in such a way as they can, they have sufficient space um, to deal with different ways in which we may want to process waste and we have more opportunities to uh, to reduce the amount that's shipped out or to change the ways in which you do it. Um, we need the sites to have space to accommodate that. And for example, in the in the case of the uh, of the potential transfer station in Baldock, there is a railway line quite close to the potential site. Um, one could locate the transfer station, so it could be rail connected in the future, or one could no locate it so it couldn't. Um, so how are we taking account of those potential future, the evolution of transfer stations? And I guess the next question on transfer stations is, are we talking to adjoining authorities about how we might share them? Um, we guess there may be cases where actually there's scope for one either just over the border that we share or just inside the border that someone else shares. Simon? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so on the transfer stations, um, Steve was right. The, the, the flexibility we need is all to do the size, really. So as long as we have the land space, uh, we can then add in um, uh, additional kit if we need it uh, for processing waste. So Waterdale, we've got a bit of capacity there if we need it in terms of some space, but not much. Uh, obviously, development of the east transfer station north uh, space is going to be the critical thing because that's what it comes down to. If we need to add kit, we need the space to add it in. So yes, absolutely right. And we are thinking of that. Um, in terms of talking to our neighbours, uh, we've done that. Uh, and we will continue to do it. Uh, we do that on all sorts of waste type issues in terms of HWRCs uh, as well as this. And um, so far, we haven't had much uh, progress with them. Let's put it that way. Uh, so some of the joint working we've suggested uh, hasn't gone forward, but we will continue to have those discussions. Uh, Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yes, thank you. Happy to. Um, I think uh, the points I make uh, would be around the efficiency of the collection rounds. Um, they are currently uh, well optimised and so travelling um, beyond our own uh, borders in terms of Hertfordshire can add significant collection costs, uh, which bring us back to the circular point about um, total service costs in terms of waste collection and disposal. Um, some of our other neighbours are, quite frankly, better served. The points have already been made, uh, so I won't repeat it, about resilience in our own network being required in any in any case. Um, but just to complete what Simon has said, yes, we do speak to our colleagues and neighbours on a regular basis. We are aware of uh, their, their disposal points, their contracts, uh, and also their transport facilities. OK, great. So I'm back where I was got to. Um, Terry, do you want to add anything? If I might, please, Chairman, just a couple of points. Yes, of course, with the Hearts Waste Partnership, we are liaising with the districts and boroughs on all these sorts of typical items here on a regular basis. And Duncan Jones and his team uh, are working together with those districts and boroughs to make sure that we are all working together if we can. Yes, the, re the re uh, reduce, reuse, recycle is still the concept we, we try to uh, uh, expound the virtues of. And so the more we can reduce, reuse, uh, before we get to recycle, then the better. But uh, that's a message which goes out regularly uh, to our, our residents. And I have to say, some are better than others. We can see that by the recycling rates of some districts and boroughs versus others. So the more we can do to get to the 60% uh, by, by, by 2030, then it will be very, very helpful if they all went in that direction and moved rapidly. As I said at full council, more houses mean more rubbish, as well as I, I think I would say more children as well, but more houses mean more rubbish, which need to be collected curbside, and therefore we have to cater for that. And that's the point that Mac made uh, around uh, additional uh, waste that's going to be generated, which hopefully most of which we can try and get recycled. One further comment about trains is, yes, you have to be near a railway line, and you have to be a railway line that goes somewhere that can connect into the places where we could take our waste. I'll give an example of Bulldog, if I may. The railway line there goes out towards Cambridge Ely and up to the East Coast. That's not the direction which we will probably have to move our rubbish. We will probably want it on the main line 
um, perhaps I use the main line that goes through from the King's Cross um, to Edinburgh main line, which is was probably the one we want to get on. To get onto that for Bulldog could be quite difficult. Um, that being said, as uh, Simon said, rail infrastructure is unbelievably expensive. As they found when they put the fifth platform in at Stevenage, unbelievably expensive, tens of millions of pounds to do it. So, um, yes, it is an option. It could be an expensive option, but it will not take that. That doesn't mean to say we should take it off the agenda. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. OK, fine. Thank you very much. So, colleagues, if there is nobody else who wants to speak, I'm going to put the recommendations to you. The recommendations are as set out in your agenda. There are three of them, seven, one, two and three. Please, could you signify if you are in agreement? Oh, Theresa, on 3.11, it does say 10 to 15. We've both heard from, from the officers and Terry that it's actually 10. But can that be amended, please? Um, or, just or just or just delete it if you don't want to have the years in there. I think my suggestion would be just deleting that for the time being. Um, OK. OK, so um, recommendations one, two and three um, in item one, it's the delete. We're deleting in brackets 10 to 15 years duration. So please, could you agree as amended? I'm assuming Drude is OK as well. Um, OK, that's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now I'm going to move to agenda item eight, um, household waste recycling centre contract update. And um, are you doing this one, Simon, or is Matt? I'll do this one and then Matt can pick up when we move into part two on the uh, the finance side of things. Oh, yeah, we're in part two. Yeah. OK, thank so, you. So, so the report in, in front of you uh, is basically setting out a recommendation uh, for the future uh, provision of our household waste recycling centre network. It's been well rehearsed with members over the last um, year or so, actually, that our current contractor, Amy, who run all of our 17 sites, have been struggling in terms of financing. Um, and we've taken, I think, three or four reports now through to panel with various updates about their struggles. We have been working with Amy to see if we can mitigate those without writing a blank check, and that hasn't been possible. Uh, and Amy formally approached us uh, back in November, really, last year to say we, we do want to see if we can negotiate an early exit. So the report in front of you really updates members and uh, talks about the conclusions to those negotiations and uh, recommends a way forward. Um, so the key for this is, is just a, a couple of things, really. During the discussions with Amy, which would best be talked about, I think, in part two in terms of the, uh, the financial side of that, uh, we looked at various options. Do we bring it back in-house if we can achieve this? Do we continue with the contract with Amy, which, of course, is an option? Um, or do we look at a, a re-procurement or local authority trading company? I'll just briefly touch on three of those that we eliminated and the reasons why. Continuing to work with Amy uh, was possible. Uh, it would put the contract under stress, though. We would have a contractor working on very high profile sites um, who perhaps wouldn't be as engaged as we want. We'd be unlikely to see improvements. We think it would turn into a, uh, a bit of a confrontational type contract, so it would cost us uh, more money to uh, manage and take forward. So it wasn't really considered as a reasonable option if and as long as we could arrive at a decent way forward with Amy to get an exit. We would thought about re-procuring, uh, assuming we did arrive at that good point with Amy on the exit. Do we go back out to the market to re-procure? The work we've done around that shows that actually the interest uh, wouldn't be huge. That said, there would definitely be companies that would come forward to bid for that. We would expect those bids to be significantly higher than Amy, which isn't a surprise on the basis they're losing money. But also, uh, household waste recycling centres aren't a great business to be in. They are difficult to make money out of. The markets are very volatile. That's the main reason uh, Amy have uh, are struggling, because the recycling markets have crashed. That's likely actually potentially to get more interesting uh, over the next uh, year or so. So uh, re-procurement wasn't seen as a practical option in terms of finance. 
We then looked at uh, bringing it uh, under the wing of a local authority trading company. And to be honest, uh, the difference between local authority trading company and bringing it in-house is relatively minor in terms of finance. Um, but there are some key points in here. Bringing it back in-house is fractionally cheaper. Uh, it's also quicker to do, and we are on a time scale if we want to get the best deal from Amy to exit this contract, so we can do that. Uh, but also it provides us with greater flexibility uh, in terms of making any decisions over the next year or two uh, on the longer term future of the Household Waste Recycling Centre. Bringing it back in-house doesn't limit our options over the next year or two. We could decide to go forward to a local authority trading company. We could go back out to re-procurement. It just provides the county council to put a steady hand on the tiller, make some decisions around that service um, and think of a way forward before deciding on perhaps what would be the best options. Um, just to say, it's worth saying that Amy have worked with us well up to this point on those sites. They've been doing a good job. Uh, they're working with us uh, on negotiations. We haven't concluded those negoti negotiations. When we get to part two, we can talk about the money side of it. But while that may be in the bag, we've still got to go through quite a lot of detail with Amy in terms of some of the haulage contracts, the off-taker contracts and other things. All that needs working through between now and hopefully an exit point at the end of September. So while we are confident and hopeful we will get to a point where we can agree a amicable exit, that isn't certain at this point in time. We've still got negotiation and work to do. I think I'll pause there um, and uh, yeah, I'll open it up to a debate or question. OK, are there any comments, questions, please? No, Terry, do you want to make some comments at this stage? Um, thank you, Chair. I think we really, when we go to part two, I might have some comments to make um, uh, to put it all together. But uh, what I just add to the point Simon made that, uh, Amy, the, the operatives have been very, very helpful, especially in recent times when we have had some challenges around closing sites in terms of because of COVID and reopening them and all the work that entailed with our operatives. So we're very pleased about the relationship we have with those people and we want to continue that relationship. But I'll talk more to that when we come out of part two. OK, fine. Thank you. Uh, Josh. Thanks. Yeah, uh, my, my query is on the way that this is being split up into part one and two. Can you confirm that we're voting on these things separately? And are we just discussing the, uh, the, the, the part one document now? Or are we going to have time to talk about part two business separately and then come back to a full vote um, for the public uh, in, in, in the public setting afterwards? I'm, yeah, I'm so just not clear on how we're, we're going about discussing yes. these two parts separately, given they relate to a the same thing thank you yes so we'll go into part two for a discussion on part two josh and then we'll come back and, and, and there's a recommendation there um which was which is set out in part one of the report so we will come back to the public yes okay, okay. um stephen right yeah um I understand where we where we got to and outside being briefed and kept informed of the situation with Amy. Uh, but given <clears throat> the issues with the Veolia contract with the incinerator and obviously with Amy, um, I do wonder whether we had a sufficiently robust process when we entered into the original contracts uh, in terms of assessing their long term viability, because obviously we did not expect to be in this position. I appreciate external markets are a factor but this is a robust commercial company that we have been dealing with who obviously had pledged to deliver this service for the time frame they entered into. Yeah, if, if I can pick up that up, Chair. Um, I think we did a cracking job at procurement, actually, in terms of the, the deal we drove. Uh, you could argue now with hindsight that perhaps it was too good a deal. Um, I think we have been very robust around due, due diligence with the company. Amy are a huge international company. They've slightly uh, changed tack. They are shedding some of their loss making contracts. There's been uh, some quite large headlines across the UK around them moving out of the, uh, some of the business. They are definitely still very much in the waste business, though. I genuinely think 
the reason we are looking at an early exit potentially it's all to do with markets it's not to do with the robustness of amy as a company is to do with they put a very competitive bid in at the start of this um i say hoping um they would have been experts they would have uh, thought about what the recycling markets did, uh, did but the world changed actually with china in particular pulling up the drawbridge for recycling that really did put a a, 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 a stranglehold on their profits so i don't think um there's any criticism here in terms of amy as the company the due diligence was solid and thorough uh, we have perhaps you could argue been unfortunate um in terms of some of our waste dealings recently but it tends to be be the case with waste and when it comes to planning in terms of the earlier comments Stephen, uh, that it's always a challenge in half year but uh, yeah i'm confident that we did all the due diligence necessary with Amy and they are good and genuine reasons for them to wanting to exit this contract. Okay, um, um, I think we're there on that one. So um, I'm going to actually um, move into um, part two, if I may. Um, that under section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting for the following items of business on the grounds that they involve or are likely to involve disclosure of exempt information and information of So officers, are we back on? Okay, we're back on, excellent, well done. So, uh, hello, we're back. Um, so we've had a discussion in part two and we're now back to the Household Waste Recycling Centre contract update in part one. Is there any more um, conversation um, required or comments from colleagues? Any more, anybody want to say anything else? Terry. Yeah, Chairman, just to sum up, if I may, um, I think everybody's made their comments. So I think Josh has just come in and he wants a comment, but I think a couple of things here, if I may, Chairman, first of all, it shows what uh, good negotiations that officers did with uh, Amy, Amy are not a little too big company. They are big boys. And they have negotiated many contracts on these sorts of things. And the fact that we got a great deal, a good deal, um, and that they had, we put the risks very much in their court rather than ours, I think is commendable. Well done, officers. You've saved the council taxpayers of uh, Hertfordshire some money, and that's uh, something which we would continue to look at to make sure we continue to do it in the, the future contracts. So um, I think we have to take that into account as well. Let me say that the deal that we've been presented with here in terms of not only the divorce, but also in terms of the path forward is best consideration. Best consideration takes into account all sorts of things from the service we give to uh, the public, to the cost, to the operatives, to the people involved in uh, uh, negotiation, et cetera, et cetera. So it is best consideration and we think it's the right thing to do. And we think it's the right direction to travel. Had we had this in place, uh, six months ago, when COVID hit the fan, um, it may have made our life easier, perhaps, in putting together how we opened the race as always recycling centres. Possibly. However, I have to say that Amy have been very, very cooperative in in, in the path forward in in opening these ten sites up on Monday. So we cannot knock Amy for that. They have done a splendid job in, in all sorts of changes mm. of things they're going to do, and the exposure which the operatives are under as well. Uh, bear in mind, we hear about police being spat at and being coughed at and these sorts of things. 
heaven for fame that that should happen on our sites. Mm. Please also bear in mind that some of the training we've had to give these guys, and mainly guys, but guys and guys as operatives, around first aid. It is difficult to do something about cardiac arrest at two metres away. And our, our operatives are capable of doing uh, of giving uh, resuscitation, but uh, not two metres away. So there's a bit of retraining being gone on there by Amy with our encouragement. They are very keen and enthusiastic to do it. So commendable. Well done, Amy. Well done, operatives. We look forward to having you, those operatives being on our team. Thank you. Yeah, I, I totally concur with you on that one, Terry. They're a great bunch. Thank you. Um, uh, I've got Josh and Stephen wanting to make quick comments. Josh. Yep, only very quick, just to say that really encouraged to see this service being brought back in house and very, very pleased to support this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Stephen? Uh, similar, and I think actually it's commendable, in fact, the staff work they've done in terms of the work with the re rearranging the contract, but actually let's not forget actually the delivery of the contract by the actual staff under Amy, who will now transfer hopefully all back to us. They've done a very commendable service uh, working for the half Hertfordshire residents and can we just be assured uh, can we just assure the public and this is a webcast that as the first of October is midweek there will be actually no disruption in the service from the continuation from Amy on the 30th into Hertfordshire CC on the 1st of October it'll be a seamless transfer. Okay, I'll comment on that if I can chairman yeah. yes we, we anticipate it to be seamless but that uh, that's the expression which we use we anticipate seeing this. <laughs> I think we can do our best, can't we? Can never foresee. So that's lovely. So thank you very much. So um, we have set out in part one of the agenda for recommendations. Um, and I'm also bringing into part one two um, of the recommend of the part. Two, I'm bringing in the two part two recommendations with um, uh, um, at, uh, the uh, financially sensitive information excluded. Um, would members like me to read the part two items or do you understand what I'm saying? OK, you're OK with that one, as long as everybody's happy with that. So I will put the recommendations to you. Um, all those in agreement, please. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't quite see. So I didn't see something quick, quick enough from Josh. He was asking me to actually read the part two. I'm sorry, Josh. Um, so the part two um, um, recommendations that are coming into the public are that the special cabinet panel recommends that cabinet authorizes the assistant director of waste and environmental and management to enter into a deed of exit with Amy by 1 September 2020 at the latest to end the current contract on 30 September 2020, subject to agreement from Amy to pay, subject to agreement by Amy and the fulfillment of all contractual obligations that would arise at the natural date of agreement and otherwise comply with the deed of exit. And the number two of that is, Subject to 2.1.1 above, 2 .1 .1 above, Cabinet authorises the Assistant Director of Transport, Waste and Environmental Management to sign and approve any necessary documents to facilitate an early end of the agreement. OK, that's lovely. Thank you very much indeed for your forbearance. That was a really good debate. Um, so now, um, item nine on the agenda are public petitions. There are none. There is no any other business. And the next meeting um, date is to be confirmed. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance. Um, it, I think we had some really good discussions, actually. That went really, really well. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have technological problems, I hope we can get them sorted out for next time we have a virtual meeting. So thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Chair. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye now, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Thank you.